Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bernie Bible this morning. It's so good to see all y'all this morning. For any of you who are here for the first time, we'd like to welcome you. Hope you feel welcome and part of the, the friendship and body here. Um, if you'd like, you can fill out a visitor's card, which is back there on that glass table, and just put it in the little basket next to it. We'd be glad to get to know you better. Or you can put it in the brown box back there as well. Quite a few announcements. A lot of them are repetitive, but so be sure to take this back and read it because there's a lot of things going on this time of year. Um, in a bit, we'll have Alex come up and talk about the Fall Fest. So that's uh, right on the horizon. A lot of fun going on there. But we need helpers. Next thing, so uh, to sign up. For, oh, that's part of that. Sorry. We need helpers. Don't forget that. So Christmas choir. We are starting choir for Christmas. If you enjoy singing, join us Wednesday, 6 p.m. at the Schaefer's for dinner and practice. All levels welcome. Uh, so if you like to make a joyful noise, you can also join. That's also good. So is that going to be happening this week? Um, where's Mr. Shaver? Yes, it's good to go. Okay. Also, uh, contact information there. Uh, Christmas shoe boxes. We uh, will pack boxes Saturday, November 7th, 9 p.m. If you want to bring items, have them here by November 1st. Lift a list of suggestions at the back. Also, to contribute to the $9 per box postage or items, specify on donation. For more information, contact Brenda Ellsworth at the number listed. So again, that'll be here at the church if you'd like to pack those shoe boxes, if you'd like to bring materials and somebody else pack them, or if you'd like to give monies towards that. That's all things you can do to get involved with that. Security team needs. If you're interested in serving uh, on the team, please see Rodney Washington at the number listed there for the security team here at the church. Also, directors, if you attend regularly and are not in our directory, please consider being included. Again, that's just a reminder as well. You don't have to be a member in order to be in that directory. That just helps people like myself who forget my own name to be able to see who you are and what your name is. So if you'd like to put all that information in there, and uh, if you're so led, put your Social Security and your uh, <laughs> bank number in there as well, and we'll be sure to get to know you better. All right. Missions Committee listed right here on the right, as well as Potluck, Women's, Men's, uh, College, Career, Junior High, Senior High, Fellowship, all those things listed on your right, prayer meetings, prayer requests for John Newman, Rick Thompson, Sharon Merriman, Emily Frymiller, Ernest Ellsworth, Stella Ellsworth, Catherine Hilgendorf, Kalani Stavall, Joy Rice, Charlotte Mashburn, Marga Mueller, Mackenzie Conley, Carrie Potts, and Car Carol Irwin. Lots of people to keep in our prayers for health for them, as well as our widows. Today as well, I'm sure we'll make mention of it, but Jerry Benjamin is here to teach again, so we'd just like to welcome him here, and it's just a great treat to hear what the Lord is going to speak to us through him and his word. So uh, also, uh, it was mentioned that uh, Franklin Graham has encouraged that today, if you so choose, it would be a great day to fast and pray for our nation, and so if you've eaten donuts, just count now from here on out. <laughs> it's okay. Um, Alex, you want to come on up? I think I'm out of jokes, so you can, serious things, and then we'll pray. Good morning. So Fall Fest is this Saturday, five day at the church. We would love for everybody to come. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll have a trunk or treat, and we'll clarify one more time that this is the trunk of your vehicle, and the cars will be parked in the parking lot, and kids can go from trunk to trunk and collect candy. So um, we'll be doing that. We'll have games, um, prizes, and a costume contest. We'll have food. We're grilling burgers and hot dogs. So that's what we'll have on Saturday. Hopefully, like I said, everybody will be there. If you are helping with the Fall Fest in some way, like you're decorating your car, you're helping with food, the games, anything like that, I would like for everybody um, who's helping to come meet me up here after the last song, after the service, just so we can kind of touch base, ask, answer any questions, um, get all on the same page with um, how that's going to work out. Um, and if you would like to help and you haven't let me know yet, now would be a great time. You can meet me after the service also up there. Thank you. And again, it's a, we've had the sign out here, so we're hopeful that a lot of people from the community will come in and we'll be able to just share the gospel. Uh, that'll be one of the booths that we'll have out there so people will hopefully initiate as well as us just mingling around, just talking about Jesus. So it'll be a great time. So are there any other things that weren't listed here that need to be announced? Okay, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
We thank you again, Lord Jesus, for just the opportunity to come together in your name to worship you in song and in word. And Lord, again, we ask that you'd speak to our hearts truth concerning Christ and that we would respond in obedience. And we lift this service unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. And do we have a missionary moment? Good morning. My name is Bill Malden, and this is my wife, Donna, over here. And this is the first time we've ever been in this church, even though the church has supported us for 10 years or so. Our contact into the church was Glenn and Wendy Martin, who we've known since all of our kids were preschoolers. And so first, uh, I want to just say thank you to the church for your interest in missions and the fact that you've been supporting us for something like 10 years. And if I understand it uh, correctly, the other thing that I'm supposed to do in 10 minutes or less is say something profound. And <laughs> I don't actually think that's going to happen. So what I would like to do is try to leave you with a visual image that maybe you can take with you. And I want to ask you, uh, in trying to create this visual image, if you know where in scripture, like in what situation, Jesus made this comment about not hiding your candle or your lamp under a bowl? Hazard a guess, who? Well, at least one of the places where he said that was after he had given the parable of the sower. And you look in your Bible and you'll find that there is usually a little man inserted heading between the two which visually disconnects them but they're not disconnected because this not hiding your lamp under a bowl is the application of the parable of the sower he had just said when people encounter the word of god there are at least four basic ways that they can respond and the last one he said responds with understanding and uses it to produce fruit and then he continued without even taking a breath and said, don't hide your candle under a bowl or under a bed. Now, from where we sit in the 21st century, does either one of those illustrations make any sense to you? I mean, well, let me ask you this. How did people light their houses in those days? Well, they, we think of them using candles, but what they actually used was these little Aladdin lamps kind of thing. And... Let me ask you then a second question that applies this. Have you ever tried to make your way through a dark house at night? And the answer is it's difficult. So what do we do? If we can take a flashlight, then we can shine it ahead of our steps and we can make our way without turning a light on. And that was the contrast that Jesus made. Because if you've ever thought about it, if you'll take and light a candle, and when we got to Latvia, these little... You've seen these little candle holders, right? They got a kind of a little saucer built under them and then they're a candle holder with a cup handle on it like that. You stick the candle in it and you can carry it around with you and if it drips, it drips into that little saucer. Okay, so you've got the visual on that. And here's the point. If you light that candle and hold it up, it wakes other people up in the house. But if you'll hold a cup or something over the top of it, then the light is only directed down like this. And then you can see to walk around without distracting anybody else. And in Jesus contrast that with putting your candle on a lampstand where now there's no interference with the light at all, so it goes everywhere, but it'll also wake other people up in the house. And also, then how about hiding your candle under a bed? Well, by the grace of God, we got to visit Israel about a year ago, and we found that in a lot of their houses in those days, the beds were up about head high, just below the ceiling, so that they could actually use that space under it. And Jesus was making this illustration that if you needed to do something at night, if you'd put the candle under the bed and then stand where the candle is between you and the wall, then once again, it doesn't disturb anybody. You see what I'm saying? Now, that's the visual I want you to see. But here's, what, here's the application. And this is what most of us miss in what Jesus was trying to say. He was saying, when you get it, don't just keep it for yourself. That's hiding your candle under a bowl. See, when I've got that candle under a bowl, I can see to walk around with the light that it provides because it's just enough for my feet, but it doesn't help anybody else around. 
And so he was making this contrast that whatever we get, don't just keep it for ourselves. It's to be shared around. And then I want to expand this because this is our Christian responsibility. We're stewards. We're not owners. I mean, it's all God's. And what have you got? You have probably heard, as I have, that we have time, talents, and treasures. And people say that because it's fairly easy to remember. And Jesus' point literally was once we get extra of anything, even if it's understanding, the parable of the sower is about understanding, okay? Pass along your understanding. Don't just keep it to yourself. I'm a Christian now. Hey, I'm going to heaven. But I don't care if anybody else does or not. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's the concept that he was trying to develop about this stuff. So if we've got extra time, talents that we're not using, treasures that are excess from what we need, guess what? They all belong to God, and he wants us to not hide it under a lamp. He wants us to spread it around. And that's what missions is about. And you can be a missionary in your own home. You can be a missionary in your own town, on your job, because it's as simple, literally, as this visual image that I hope you'll take away of not hiding your candle under a bowl. It's not just for you. It's for everybody around you. Thank you, and God bless you. Good morning. Y'all would stand and join us.
God, thank you for your life that you've given to us in abundance, that it, by faith we can declare that it is well with our soul. We thank you for the peace that passes understanding, that we can look to you in every moment for the grace that is so rich and abundant and your mercies that pursue us, Father God. We love you and we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all may be seated. morning good to see everybody every year at this time of year we have jerry benjamin that comes to his hill and teaches for two weeks with us teaches the book of daniel the first week the book of revelation the second we always want folks to know you're welcome to come up and sit in in classes whenever you'd like especially the evening classes just call ahead so you can make sure that that the schedule is um so that who's teaching that you want to hear um and um anyway jerry is here this week jerry is from colorado springs um, has an itinerant ministry, but with COVID, hasn't been so itinerant lately. In fact, I think this is the first place he's been in seven months, something like that. So we're glad to have him. And I really appreciate Jerry and his ministry, his dear brother in Christ. And he's always been so faithful in all the years that I've known him. And that was while he still had black hair. So it was really going back a long time. And um, all the years I've known him, he's just been so faithful to, to preach Jesus and to bring us to our Lord and Savior Christ. And so it's great to have you with us again. Thank you, Jerry. Make it our home in Colorado Springs since 2005. We live at 7,000 feet elevation, so we are much closer to God than. Uh, <laughs> actually, God told Israel to tear, tear down the high place. <laughs> in the precious and matchless name of our risen, living, and indwelling Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, it is once again my humble privilege and great joy to be with you here at Bernie Bible Church anticipating all that the Lord is going to do by and through the ministry of the Word of God as we are taught by the Spirit of God in order to know more personally, more intimately, the Son of God, and that, of course, is our precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As in times past, my purpose in being here is simply to be a signpost. And a signpost points people to their destination, but once we arrive at the destination, the signpost is no longer necessary. In fact, the signpost is usually forgotten. And our destination is simply the person, the presence, and the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there is a difference between prominence and preeminence. The words might sound the same, but they do not mean the same. Prominence conveys the idea of one among many. That thing, that person might be important, but they're one among other things or other people that are important. So if I was to say to my wife, Linda, sweetie, you are prominent in my affections, it's actually going to raise more questions than it's going to answer because her first question is obviously going to be, well, Jerry, who else is prominent in your affections? She doesn't want to be prominent. She wants to be preeminent, which she is because preeminence means there is no one else. It means the one and the only one. But more than in the husband's affections for his wife or the wife's affections for her husband, Paul reminds us in Colossians 1 and verse 18 that Christ is to have the preeminence in and over everything in our life. But what has happened among many believers today is that we've given Christ a place, but does he have the place? We've included him in our life, we've made him part of our life, but is he our very life? In fact, the way the gospel is sometimes unfortunately and regrettably preached in this country, and certainly not here at Bernie Bible Church, is add Jesus to your life and you'll be a better person. And so we add Jesus to our life like we might add marriage to our life, or we add children to our life, or we add a new living location to our life, or we add a new ministry to our life, or we add retirement to our life. And now Jesus becomes one more thing that we add to our life along the way of life rather than being the way, the truth, and the life. Christ is not someone that we include in our life, make part of our life, or add to our life. He is our very life. Now, beloved, this is not a New Testament truth introduced following the death and resurrection of Christ. For back in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 20, God, through his servant Moses, said to the blood-bought people of the Old Testament, the Lord is your life. And this is the truth that Paul is echoing in Philippians 1 and verse 21 when he says that for me to live is Christ. Paul is not saying he's living for Jesus. Rather, he is saying living 
is Jesus, that on the road to Damascus, the center of his life changed. No longer Saul of Tarsus, not even the Apostle Paul, but Christ and Christ alone. And so this morning, we're going to be reminded of some very, very precious truths that we've all heard before. In fact, I need to give full disclosure here, is that this truth was actually preached here at Bernie Bible Church a number of years ago. It was just after the Battle of the Alamo. Some of you might remember that, those of you who fought in the Battle of the Alamo. Uh, by the way, I know that they all didn't make it. But in any case, uh, but both the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter said they were not ashamed of reminding their readers of the same truth over and over again. Because, beloved, we are prone to wander. We are prone to stray. We are prone to drift away. In fact, the hymn writer even wrote that we are prone to wander. And so, as I've been praying about what the Lord would have me to say uh, on this uh, Lord's Day, it's a truth that we've heard before, it's been preached here before, but we need to be reminded of, especially in these days that we're currently in, in light of the COVID-19 and also the upcoming election, is that God is faithful. So let's look to the Lord in prayer once again, and then we'll continue on in his word. Father in heaven, we do pause to acknowledge our need of thee, our total, complete, and utter dependence upon thee. That, Father, that we don't come to the understanding of these truths just by engaging our mind, but the Spirit of God is our teacher, remind, uh, teaching us about the person of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that the purpose of revelation is not just to impart information, but to produce transformation. That as we behold him, the Lord Jesus, that we be transformed into his likeness from glory to glory. And so, Father, I pray that this would not just be another talk, another sermon, but rather it would, because it is your truth and you have promised that your truth will not return void. It will accomplish the purpose for which it is designed, and that is to reveal Christ and to transform us into the image of Christ. I pray that that would be the fruit of this morning's message, not because of anything that the speaker has said, but by the ministry of your Holy Spirit who was given to glorify, and that is to reveal the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that these truths would be the reality of our own life as we are looking unto Jesus, the author, the finisher, the completer, the perfecter of our faith. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. God wants us to know him, and so God has made himself known. God, who desires an individual, intimate, personal, living, loving relationship with each and every one of us, desires to reveal himself, and he is the initiator and has made himself known. Beloved, we don't know God by human wisdom, by rational reasoning, by intellectual pursuit, by academic achievement, by scholarly research, or just by surfing the internet. God is not the sum total of our theologies or doctrinal, stu uh, doctrinal statements. God is not a consensus of who the majority of people think that he is. John the Baptist said a man can receive nothing unless he receives it from above. And John here is not talking about physical material things. He is talking about spiritual truth. The only way we know God is because God is the initiator, is because God has made himself known. Now, what we are talking about here is that we know God by revelation, not by reason. This is not mystical. This is not magical. This is not speculation. This is not imagination. We know the person of God by the word of God. For Jesus said in John 5 and verse 39, these words referring to the scriptures testify of me, testify of Christ. Beloved, God has given us his word not to solve our problems, answer our questions, or meet our needs. That is all secondary. He has given us the word of God in order to know the person of God, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if there is one truth that God continually reveals and reminds us throughout all of Scripture is that he is faithful. As a matter of fact, you're familiar with the verse there in Lamentations 3, verse 23, when Jeremiah writes, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Now, as Jeremiah is penning these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the city of Jerusalem is being besieged by the Babylonians. The city is being decimated. The people are being deported. The temple is being destroyed. And in all of this, Jeremiah writes, great is thy faithfulness. Because Jeremiah's understanding of the faithfulness of God was not based on his circumstances. It was based on the character of God himself. 
The circumstances of our life may change, but the faithfulness of the one who is our life will never change because God is faithful. The faithfulness of God permeates all of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. As a matter of fact, God first demonstrated his faithfulness and the faithfulness of his own person by both the promise and the provision of the Redeemer. Now, God knows all things. God is omniscient. And so we read in Revelation 13 and verse 8 that the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. God was not waiting to see if Adam and Eve would remain on the path of obedience or would they choose the path of disobedience. He knew they would sin. God is not the author of sin. God is not the uh, initiator of sin. God uh, did not make them sin. But in his foreknowledge, he knew they would sin. And so provision was made for their sin and our sin before he ever created Adam and Eve. Jesus says in John 10 that the good shepherd goes before the sheep. The good shepherd leads the sheep. And that means the good shepherd arrives at the pasture before the sheep do. So when the sheep get to the new pasture, we don't say, oh, what smart sheep they are. All the honor goes to the shepherd. But also because the shepherd is in front of the sheep, leading the sheep, Jesus arrives at the problem before we do. He knows our need before we ever become aware of this. And this is clearly demonstrated in Revelation 13, 8, that the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. So when God said to Adam and Eve, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die, it's not that the fruit was poisonous. It's that to eat of the fruit was disobedience. Disobedience is sin. And God is establishing in the second chapter of our Bible that he is a holy God and the wages of sin is death. Now, the death that God was talking about was twofold. It was spiritual death, separation from God, but it was also physical death. God created Adam and Eve where they would have lived indefinitely had they never sinned. Death, if you, physical death, is the result of sin. Now, again, God is not the author of sin. He did not make them sin, but he knew that they would sin, and God made provision for their sin. He said, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die, both spiritual death and physical death. Now, Adam and Eve did not physically physically die in the garden in the day that they ate thereof. They lived for another 900 plus years, but there was physical death. It was the death of that animal. The animal died instead of in place of Adam and Eve. Beloved, it's all foreshadowing the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to Christ not because he suffered for us. We come to Christ because he was the substitute for us. And so what God did is he provided a substitute. God used the skins of that animal to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness, but he used the blood of that animal to cover their sinfulness, all anticipating, foreshadowing, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that was the picture that God gave, but God also gave this promise, and the promise is in Genesis 3 and verse 15, that the one being pictured here, who is a substitute, would be the seed of the woman. He would come through the womb of the woman. Now, up to this point, that is all the revelation that God has given. We don't know that the woman's going to be a virgin until Isaiah chapter 7. We don't know that the seed is going to come through the line of Abraham until Genesis chapter 12. We don't know he's going to be from the tribe of Judah until Genesis 49. We don't know he's going to be the family of David until 2 Samuel chapter 7. We don't know he's going to be born in Bethlehem until Micah chapter 5. God reveals himself, his person, his plan, his program, and his purposes, I used to say in a progressive manner, but the politicians have stolen that word. So now I've got to say that God does it in an unfolding manner. In other words, he's not given us all the truth about that particular truth all at the same time. God just simply said, promised to Adam and Eve that the Redeemer is going to be the seed of the woman. Now it is following that promise that Adam names his wife Eve. She's only called woman back in Genesis 2. That's not a derogatory demeaning term. It is in Genesis chapter 3, following the promise that Adam names Eve. The name Eve means mother of all living, but that's not what the word Eve literally means. It means life giver or giver of life. Not that Eve would be the giver of life, but the one who would come through Eve would be the giver of life, the giver of eternal life, the giver of abundant life. God had just said, God had just promised that the Redeemer is going to be the seed of the woman. Who does Adam think that woman's going to be? Eve. She's the only woman around. The point is, is that Adam believed God to be faithful. Now, it's not just Adam, it's also Eve, because in Genesis 4 and verse 1, Eve says about her firstborn that God has appointed unto me, uh, let me uh, make sure I'm quoting this correctly, I do not have a photographic memory, and so that's why I have to stop. 
and refer to her to the scripture. But Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1, Adam knew his wife Eve, she conceived the bore Cain, and Eve says, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now the better word here is even the Lord. Eve is not thinking of uh, Cain's um, origin, that he came from the Lord. She's not denying that. She's thinking in terms of Cain's destiny, that perhaps he is the Lord. Now, of course, he wasn't because he killed his brother Abel. So Cain, if you will, is disqualified. He's a murderer. Abel is dead. And now Seth is born. And Eve says about Seth that God has appointed unto me not another son, not another child, but another seed, that she thinks that perhaps Seth is going to be the uh, seed of the woman. The point is not just Adam, but also Eve believed God to be faithful, faithful to his person, faithful to his promise, and faithful to his purposes. Now, if you're familiar with Hebrews chapter 11, where we have, quote, the heroes of faith, the first individual listed there is not Adam and Eve. It is Abel. And the reason why Adam and Eve are not listed there is because they had already seen the object of their faith. As we just sang, their faith had become, was sight. They had already walked with God. They'd already seen the object of their faith. And so God begins with Abel. Because see, if God began with Adam and Eve, we say, well, it's easy for them to believe God. They've already seen God. They've already been in God's physical presence. So God begins with Abel, that we can believe God. We can count on the faithfulness of God, even though we have not yet physically seen the very person of God. And so we find that Adam and Eve, the first two to ascend, are also the first two to believe God and to believe that God is faithful. Now, in Genesis chapter 12, God is going to give us, if you will, more revelation, an unfolding of his person, plan, and purposes, where God says that the seed, the Redeemer, is not just going to be the seed of the woman, but he is also going to come through the line of Abraham. Now, this is why the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, are sometimes referred as God's chosen people. Beloved, this does not in any way indicate or even suggest that the Jewish people are vastly superior, greater spirituality, or that God likes them better than the Gentiles. That isn't it at all. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, God said to uh, the, the nation of Israel, he said, I chose you not because you were the most of all people, but because you were the least. It's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, is that God takes that which is weak, that which people reject, that which be, people count as, as, as worthless, and that's what God uses for his glory. When God, when the Jewish people refer to as God's chosen people, it simply is referring that this is the cert, it's due to the certainty that this is the bloodline through which Messiah is going to come. It has nothing to do with who the Jewish people are. It has everything to do with who God is, that God is faithful. And we open up to our New Testament. The very first words, the very first verse is that this is the generation, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. So the first verse of our New Testament once again proves, validates, confirms that God is faithful, that what God had said to Abraham, that in thee and thy seed shall all the families be blessed. That is, the blessed sore is going to come through the line of Abraham. And this is why, without, uh, if you will get into any more detail, that Satan has been out to destroy the Jewish people ever since Genesis chapter 12 is to prevent the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But also, too, is that God said to uh, Abraham, is not only is the a blesser going to come through your line, but also the ruler is going to come to you, through your line. Jesus Christ was rejected, not because he couldn't prove his credentials as Messiah, not because he didn't perform enough miracles or provide enough signs, and it wasn't because Israel was looking for a political Messiah who would deliver them from Rome, and God gave him a spiritual Messiah who would deliver them from sin. He was rejected because they said, we will not have this man rule over us. Christ was rejected as ruler. But there to Abraham, God is saying not only is the Redeemer, the Blesser coming through your line, but also the very ruler himself, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now we come to the end of Genesis, Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10. And there God, through Jacob, says to his fourth-born son Judah, is that the scepter will not depart from your tribe. A scepter is a rod or a staff that a king uses in order to show his rule, his uh, reign over his dominion. God says for, through Jacob to Judah that the scepter will not depart from your tribe until Shiloh comes. Now, Shiloh is simply a Hebrew word that has been transliterated into our English language. Not translated, but transliterated. It simply means he whose right it is to rule. I come from a Jewish background, so people assume that I'm a Hebrew scholar, and 
and that is simply not true. I, uh, English is, I'm still learning English as my first language. I do not know Hebrew. Now, my wife, Linda, is a Gentile believer, married to me, a Jewish believer. She sometimes asks if she knows a little Hebrew. And she said, well, yes, I married one. So now you all know a little Hebrew. <laughs> But this word Shiloh simply means he whose right it is to rule. So God is saying through uh, Jacob to Judah that the one who has the right to rule is going to come through the tribe of Judah. Now, if you're familiar with the uh, sons of Jacob, is that Judah was not the firstborn. The firstborn was Reuben. He was the only one that got a sandwich named after him. And then, so why wasn't this promise, if you will, given to Reuben? He was the oldest son. Well, Reuben had sin. He was involved in an immoral situation with one of his father's concubines. But then we also have Simeon and Levi. And they're the second and third. Levi was the only one that got the genes named after him. But in any case, why wasn't this given to them? Well, they were involved in sin as well because they had, uh, through them, uh, all the men of Shechem were, were, were killed. But now we come to Judah, the fourthborn, that he is not without sin. He had a physical relationship with his daughter-in-law, Tamar. So why is the promise given to Judah and not to the other three? Judah is the only one who repented. Beloved, God says, a broken and a contrite heart he will not despise. In Isaiah 57 and verse 15, God says, I dwell in two places. I dwell in eternity, but I also dwell with those of a broken and a contrite heart. Now, we think of brokenness to be a disaster, that something comes into our life that seems to ruin and destroy everything, but that's not how brokenness is defined. Christ himself defines brokenness. When he took of the bread there at the Last Supper, he said, this is my body, which is, present tense, broken for you. So he's speaking more than just about the crucifixion. The crucifixion was the climax of it, if you will, but he says he's using present tense as my whole life. Here on this earth was a life of brokenness. And then Christ defines it for us there in, um, when he's in the garden, when he says, not my will, but thine be done. A summary statement of his entire life in ministry on this earth. Brokenness is simply no will of my own. And in Judah's case, this was seen in his confession and his repentance. But beloved, every one of us who names the name of Christ at that moment of salvation, whether we were four years old like our daughter or 92 like my dad, we were broken. We had no will of our own. We accepted God's word that the wage of sin is death. We accepted God's way that there is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved other than Christ. So whether we recognize it, acknowledge it or not, we were broken at that moment of salvation. It was not my will, it was God's will. And so Jesus, I'm sorry, Paul writes in Colossians, as you receive Christ, so walk ye in him. The way we're saved is the way we live, a condition of brokenness, having no will of my own. It's not this downtrodden, woe is me, uh, always putting myself down. That isn't brokenness at all. By the way, humility is not belittling oneself. Humility is no thought of oneself. Beloved, when we run ourselves down, that is not humility. That is pride. We're just calling attention to ourselves of what a terrible person we think we are, and it's drawing all the attention to, to us. Humility is no thought of oneself. And this is a work of God. We can't make ourselves humble any more than, than we can change our own character. It is all of Christ and none of me. So God tell, tells us in Genesis 49 and verse 10 that the Redeemer, the Blessor, the Ruler is not only going to come through the woman, not only from the line of Abraham, but now through the tribe of Judah. And by the way, you're familiar with the last 13 chapters of Genesis. It's not the story of Joseph. It is the account of the faithfulness of God in the life of Joseph. God has given us 13 chapters so that Israel, when they go through difficult times, they can look back and be reminded of the faithfulness of God in the life of, of Joseph, where everything just seemed to, quote, go against them. And yet Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Not only that Joseph would be blessed, that he'd be second in line there in Egypt, but Joseph knew more of the faithfulness of God through the circumstances that he went through. But now we come over to 2 Samuel. Samuel chapter 7 and verse 16. And there God is going to say to David. So the Redeemer here, who is also the ruler and the blesser, is not just the line coming through the seed of the woman, not just the line of Abraham, not just the tribe of Judah, but now he is going to be a physical descendant of David. That's why our New Testament again begins with these words. The generation, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of 
of David, the son of Abraham. The first verse of our New Testament reminds us that God is faithful. So over in 2 Samuel chapter 7, this is before David sins by committing the adultery. God says to David uh, that there is going to be a physical descendant who is going to sit on your throne and rule over your people. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 16. I've been home now for the last seven. This is the first time I've been in ministry now for seven months, and I've been using a different Bible, and so consequently what has happened is that some of these pages here got stuck together. Back in March, the last time I preached, I had a cold, and so somebody gave me a cough drop that had sugar, and I try to avoid sugar because it acts as a sedative in my body, but some of you might know that when sugar gets wet, it kind of it forms kind of a, a cementing action, and so as I'd be speaking with the cough drop in my mouth and mixed with the sugar, and there'd be some saliva that would kind of kind of spray out onto the uh, page of the Bible, when I'd close the Bible, the pages stuck together, and so what was happening is that I was sugarcoating the Word of God. But in any case, here in 2 Samuel 7, and verse 16, God says to David, and we're just summarizing this, he says that thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever, and thy throne shall be established forever. Thine house, that is the person who's going to be the fulfillment of this, is going to be a direct descendant of David. That's why we have a genealogy in the first 16 verses of our New Testament. It's there to prove that Jesus Christ is a direct legal descendant of David and therefore has the rights to David's throne or, quote, has the right to rule. God doesn't put the genealogy in there just to pad the scriptures, beloved. I know when we read the Christmas story that's going to be coming up here pretty soon, we tend to skip over the genealogy in uh, Matthew and also in Luke. First of all, we can't pronounce the names, but th also we think that they have no practical application. Beloved, they are demonstrating, they are proving the faithfulness of God. Also in verse 16, thy kingdom. Thy kingdom means the one who, uh, the, the, this physical descendant of David, the one who's going to fulfill this promise, is going to rule over, and that's all believers, Jewish believers and Gentile believers. Beloved, Gentile believers are the seed of Abraham. That is that they receive all of the spiritual and physical promises that God had promised uh, to, to Abraham. Israel is only referring to physical descendants of Abraham, believers such as myself or unbelievers such as my two brothers. But Gentiles are never referred to as Israel, but they are the seed of Abraham. There is no underprivileged child of God. There is no neglected child of God. Beloved, I didn't get a head start because I was born of a Jewish family. I was raised in rabbinic Judaism. I wasn't raised in what the Word of God said in the Old Testament. I was raised in what the Word of man said in trying to interpret the Old Testament. Testament. And so actually, Gentile believers have a much cleaner slate, if you will, and, and while I'm, God is having to purge out all the stuff that I was uh, taught in for the first 22 years of my life, there is nobody has a head start, nobody uh, uh, has, has a, uh, is, is a head, if, if you will. Beloved, there again, there is no underprivileged child of God, there is no neglected child of God. And by the way, our background, our past does not determine our destiny. Here was Rahab. She was a harlot. She was a liar. She, she, was, she was despised. And yet she not only believes God, she is actually in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1. Our past does not determine our destiny. What determines our destiny is whether we receive, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, or we reject him. That is what's going to determine our destiny. And so here, uh, continuing on here in verse 16 of 2 Samuel 7, thy throne shall be established forever. Throne here is the one who has the right to rule. This is referring to Shiloh. So let's just come over to Luke chapter 2 for a moment, and we're going to be reading this probably in more detail in the next couple of months as we approach and remember the incarnation of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Luke chapter 1 and verse... Um, Twenty um, verse 30, 32, 
Gabriel is revealing to Mary that it's going to be through her womb. She is the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. God said that the Redeemer is going to be the seed of the woman, and now it's being fulfilled in the womb of Mary. And if you remember in Galatians 4 and verse 4, God said, In the fullness of time, God the Father sent forth his Son, born of a woman. Again, reminding us of the faithfulness of God. And so Gabriel says here to Mary in chapter 1 of Luke and verse 32, He shall be great, referring, of course, to the Lord Jesus Christ. He shall be called the Son of the Most Highest, and the Lord God shall give Give him the throne of his father David, and, of, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Same three words, different order, house, kingdom, and throne. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment. Beloved, all of God's promises, all of God's prophecies are fulfilled in a person. Yes, God might use Israel, God might use the church, but ultimately they're all fulfilled in a person. So since we're in Luke, let's just go over to chapter 4 and verse 16. When Jesus, who was born under the law, lived under the law and died under the law, the law did not conclude, if you will, with the incarnation of Christ, but the crucifixion of Christ. There in Colossians chapter 2, when the document was nailed to the cross, that is the law. But here Christ, born under the law, lived under the law, died under the law. We read here in chapter 4 and verse uh, 16 that as was his custom, he was in Nazareth. And as was his custom, because of the Sabbath, that he went into the synagogue. And when he went into the synagogue, it was given to him the... Um, Old Testament, and he opened up to the prophet Isaiah, and he read these words. It's Isaiah chapter 61, of course, referring to him, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and set at liberty those who are bruised. Verse 19 of Luke chapter 4, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So all the prophecy there concerning uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is now being fulfilled concerning, if you will, Israel's Messiah, is now being fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so verse 20, he closed the book and he said that this day the scripture is fulfilled. That is Shiloh has come. What God had promised to Adam and Eve, that the Redeemer would be the seed of Abraham, that he would come through the line of, of I'm sorry, the seed of the woman, that he would come through the line of Abraham, that he would be of the tribe of Judah, that he would be a direct descendant of David. All of this now is being fulfilled in your very presence. This is what he means in verse 21. Today the scriptures are filled. Shiloh has come. And so now we read in verse 28 that all those that were in the synagogue when they heard these things were filled with joy. No. They were filled with wrath. Why? Because Christ was not rejected as redeemer. He was rejected as ruler. They later said, we will not have this man reign or rule over us. So again, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, the very first verse of our New Testament is reminding us of the faithfulness of God, the generations, that is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. God has, is now fulfilling his purpose, his promises in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. We see this all the way through. In fact, Jesus Christ was even demonstrating the faithfulness of God throughout his earthly ministry when he uh, said to those who uh, were, were, were listening to him, he said in Luke chapter 18, he said, if... Um, you earthly fathers, when your son asks you for, uh, for, for bread, you don't give him a stone. When they ask for fish, you don't give him a snake. When they ask uh, for an egg, you don't give him a scorpion. You being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who have trusted in him? Why? Because God is faithful. In Luke chapter um, 11, God, the Lord Jesus Christ reminds us that if God is willing to give his greatest gift to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the indwelling Holy Spirit, will he not give any other, quote, good gift that would bring us into a more intimate relationship with Christ because God is faithful. John chapter 14 and verse 1. Jesus has just told his disciples that he's going back to the Father's house, and this produced a severe spiritual heart attack in the life of these disciples. Christ had been everything to them. He had been their very life, and they could not imagine how they could live life apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when Christ says in John 14 and verse 1, let not your heart be troubled, 
Christ wants to remove that which has already taken place. John chapter 16 and verse 6. Christ said, because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Sorrow has controlled your heart. So it's not that Christ is trying to prevent something from happening. He's trying to remove what is already happening. So what, if I can paraphrase John 14 and verse 1, let not your heart go on being troubled. You believe God, believe also in me. If there is one truth that God has been revealing to these Jewish believers, actually to all mankind since the very beginning of our Bible, is that God is faithful. Jesus Christ demonstrated that there at the wedding of Canaan, John chapter 2, when they ran out of wine and uh, they didn't know how the problem was going to be solved. And when they came to Mary, Mary said to the servants, whatever Jesus says, do it, because she knew that Jesus is faithful. He will always do the right thing. He will always do that which will glorify the Father. John chapter 10, Jesus Christ is the good shepherd because he is the faithful shepherd. Beloved, sheep cannot exist without the shepherd. And Jesus Christ could not be the good shepherd if he was not the faithful shepherd. John chapter 11, Lazarus is already dead. He's in the tomb. Jesus comes to Bethany. And when Mary... Um, I'm sorry, when Martha says to him, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died, she was not reprimanding Jesus because she said, I know whatever you do now, whatever you ask of the Father, he will do it. She knew that Jesus is faithful. He will always do that which is right. He will always do that which is best. He will always do that which will glorify the Father. When the uh, mothers with their newborn children let Jesus take their babies up uh, in, in, in his arms, why did they trust him? With, with their newborn, with their most precious treasure, because they knew that Jesus is faithful. And he will always, without exception, do that which is right, that which is best, and that which will glorify the Father. By the way, Christ is also going to be faithful to his words to the unbeliever, that if they refuse to believe in him, they will be separated from him for all eternity. Jesus is not a kindly old grandfather who just simply winks at our rejection and says, well, you did the best you could, we'll let you into heaven anyway. He is faithful to his word. And by the way, the rejection is not ignorance, it is willful. It's not that they didn't know, it's not that they didn't understand. It is willful, deliberate rejection of the person of Christ. By the way, we'll save that for another time. Let's continue on here. Paul here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9 is going to summarize in three words what I have been attempting to say in 30 minutes. And by the way, I am purposely going long here this morning so that next week you will appreciate Charlie when he finishes on time. So anyway, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. By the way, as Charlie mentioned, I'm, uh, we make our home in Colorado Springs. That is mountain time. So it's only 10 minutes to 11. I haven't reset my watch. I was going to wait till after the sermon. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9, God is faithful. So in three words here, Paul is summarizing what I've been attempting to say in 30 minutes. God is faithful, no exception. Over 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, very, very familiar portion of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. There is no temptation or trial, testing, that have been taken us as just common but God is faithful who will provide a way of escape. Now, we often think the way of escape is a change of circumstances. Sometimes it is, but the way of escape is the personal presence of Christ. Beloved, we've used this illustration before. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to worship the golden image, which represented Nebuchadnezzar himself, and so uh, Nebuchadnezzar threw them into the burning, fiery furnace. And so God provided a way of escape. The way of escape was in the fiery furnace for two reasons. First of all, Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't get in there. But secondly, that was the personal presence of Christ. He was the Son of God, the fourth one walking around there. The, the way of escape is the personal presence of Christ. Sometimes it is a change of circumstances, but sometimes, I mean, I, I, I want to be careful as I say this. When a believer dies, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so sometimes, if you will, the, quote, way of escape is physical death for the believer because that ushers them into the very presence of the Lord, perfect union, perfect oneness, perfect intimate fellowship with our Savior. The psalmist writes in Psalms uh, 91, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide uh, under the shadow of the Almighty. The secret place of the Most High, beloved, 
are the fiery furnaces. They are the lion's den. They are the pandemic that we've been experiencing the last nine, 10 months here. The, the secret place of the Most High are the, the things that we think are useless, we think are fruitless, we think have no purpose in our life, and that's when we abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Christ is all that we need. The only problem is we don't realize, recognize, and acknowledge He's all that we need until He's all that we have. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 24. Faithful is he who has called you, he'll also do it. Now, this is not about our ministry for him. This is about our relationship with him. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24. Notice the previous verse, verse 23. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. That the very God of peace shall sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful of you, who has called you, who will also do it. What is he going to do? He is going to sanctify us. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, he who has begun the good work, that is our salvation, our relationship with him, is going to complete that good work, that is our sanctification. And notice, be preserved blameless. In other words, he is, Christ is the one who secures us. Christ is the one who keeps us. We are not holding on to Jesus. Jesus is holding on to us. Back years ago, when we were in Dallas, Texas, when I was going to uh, school there, our daughter Katie was only about two, three years old. And it was a Friday afternoon, five o'clock, when we had to cross a very busy intersection at the intersection with the light. But it was still, if you will, somewhat dangerous because people in Dallas, Texas, especially on Friday evenings, run the red lights. I know people in San Antonio would never even dream of doing something like that, but people would do that. I was looking, for, this was Highway 12, it was, it, was, um, it was six lanes, three going each direction, and even with the, the traffic light, I was still trying to find another place to cross it, but there was no other place. So I didn't want to put too much fear into the Harvard Little Girl, but I just said to Katie, I said, Katie, when the light turns and it's green in our direction, we're going to wait for a couple of seconds, let the traffic clear, and then I'm going to ask you to take my hand, and I want you to hold my hand as we cross the six lanes of traffic, three lanes going in each direction. The traffic light turned green in our direction, waited a couple of seconds, the traffic cleared, turned to Katie, I asked her to take my hand, and she did. She was obedient. She held my hand that entire six lanes, three lanes going in an opposite direction. But that whole time that she was holding my hand, I was actually holding her hand. I was not about to trust the maturity of a two or three year old at that moment because if Katie got distracted or got curious and let go of me and just ran off in another direction, I knew there wouldn't be time to catch up with her. So as soon as she took hold of my hand, I positioned my hand around her hand in such a way that I had her. And we might think we're holding on to Jesus, but Jesus is holding on to us. He is faithful. He will keep us. He is the one who sustains us. Ephesians chapter 6, the shield of faith, beloved, is not our faith in him. It is his faithfulness to us. He is the shield. Beloved, these are not pieces that we pray on each morning. This is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God doesn't give us things. He has given us himself. Uh, he is the belt of truth because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the breastplate of righteousness because he himself has been made unto us righteous. And he is the shoes of peace, as we just sang, because he is our peace. Jesus, in me you will have peace. But he's also the shield of faith. Now, God often uses truth in the physical realm to teach us truth in the spiritual realm. And that shield that the Roman soldier used was a, called a door shield because it looked like a door. It's two feet wide, three feet high, and it was light enough they could carry it with them in the battle, but also when they were being attacked by the fiery darts of, of the opponent, they can put the shield down and they could crouch behind it in such a way to prevent the fiery darts from hitting them. Now, when they're crouched behind that shield, they are not thinking of the fiery darts. They're not even thinking about the enemy. They can't even see the enemy. They are, if you will, just consumed with that shield, that there was no defects, that there was no recalls to it, and that it was going to function the way it was designed. Christ is the shield of faith. He is my protector. He is my sustainer. He is my sufficiency. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, even if we are faithless, he remains faithful and he will not deny himself. In other words, if you will, Christ's faithfulness to us is not based on our faithfulness to him. He is faithful to himself and therefore he is faithful to each and every one who names the name of Christ. And then in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23, let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that has promised. 
Beloved, our faith in God is based upon the faithfulness of God. Jesus Christ is the one who supports us, sustains us, secures us. He carries us along. In fact, it's visualized in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 11. I love this verse. Is that he, he's spreading out his wings and he is carrying us along on, on eagle wings. In other words, that doesn't, we, we're, we're still to be walking in obedience to him, but it is his faithfulness that sustains us, that supports us, that, that secures us, that carries us along. He is undergirding us. Therefore, I can trust Christ. I do don't need to take matters into my own hands. The circumstances of my life may change, but the faithfulness of the one who is my life will never change because God is faithful. Beloved, the promises of God, the prophecies of God, the provisions of God, the protection of God, the all-sufficiency of God, the security of God is all based on the faithfulness of God. This is the truth that permeates all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, when Christ returns there in Revelation chapter 19, he is called faithful and true. At the conclusion of his life, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, he says, I know whom I have believed. He did not say, I know what I have believed, principles to live by, standards, convictions, commitments, disciplines, theology, doctrine, a, a, a Christian worldview. He says, I know whom I have believed, and that is the person of God. God is faithful, and therefore, I can trust him, I can submit to him, and allow him to be my very life. Because he is faithful, I do not need to take circumstances into my own hands. Because the circumstances of my life may change, the faithfulness of the one who is my life will never change. Can we, along with the Apostle Paul, say, I know whom I have believed? And that is the person of God who is faithful. There is in our pew a hymnal, and on page 43 is the old hymn of the faith that just affirms, confirms what we have been reminded of here this morning, of great is thy faithfulness. I did not mention this to the musicians. I don't mean to put them on the spot, but we, you can't sing it? Oh, okay. So they are going to come up and sing it. So I'm glad we're not living under the law of the Medes and the Persians where nothing can be changed. <laughs> so page 43 is great is thy faithfulness. And let's sing it as God reminds us that he is faithful.
uh, just as a reminder, those who are helping out with the uh, fall festival this year to meet Alex at the piano here after World Sound. Thank you.